Welcome back to Believe in Softball. I'm your host, Jenna Becerra. And like I said before, it is Women's History Month. And we celebrated International Women's Day this week. To me, on the one hand, it seems kind of weird that we still have to have dedicated holidays to recognize a group that makes up half the population. But on the other hand, I'm always up for celebrating women and girls and just how badass we are. So that's what we do on the show, and this episode is no exception. So some quick reminders for the show. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Believe in Softball. That's B-L-E-A-V. And we have video. Believe in Softball is also on YouTube, so please subscribe. All right, let's go through today's batting order. First, we'll cover our bases, give you some news and call-outs from around the softball world. Then we'll head into today's interview with Ramona Shelburne. And, you know, she's just, to me, the epitome of taking lessons learned in sports and then applying them to become successful in life. And it's an inspiration. So I'm, I'm excited for that. And we'll end things with the foul tip of the week where I share tips to help us keep going and to get better. All right, let's get going. Covering our bases. Football might be over for this season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, Bet Online is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. Head on over to the website or use your mobile devices to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code BELIEVE to get started. And it's not just basketball. Bet Online's your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds. From sports right down to your favorite Vegas casino games, Bet Online is your number one online wagering destination. Bet Online, the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports and play your favorite games. Bet Online, where the game starts. For our game, in softball, you know, I think, and I've said this before on this show and in general, that nowadays hitting is better than pitching in today's game. And if I had to rank it, I would say hitting is first, then pitching, then defense. But I'm excited because this season, I feel like I'm seeing a little bit more from pitchers. You know, I, I mentioned last week in the episode that Stanford had three pitchers, different pitchers who threw no hitters all in a row, including a perfect game in the middle there. And, and there's more perfect games that we're seeing. You know, in week four was Megan Framo, USF's Georgina Korik, who that was only the fourth one ever in USF's history. Mizzou's Lauren Krings threw one, Elon's Taylor Cherry, only the third one in Elon's history. And then, you know, we saw some back-to-back -back no hitters from Izzy Vetter from Evansville. And I think if you combine these sort of call-outs, because perfect games are one thing, no hitters are one thing, but to have just good, solid pitching throughout the entire season is another thing. So you look at people like Montana Fouts, Keely Richard. Jordy Ball, just a freshman at Oklahoma. Gabby Plain. Like, there's a lot of good pitchers. There are a lot of good pitchers right now in college softball. And I'm excited and interested in not only this current wave of pitchers that we have, but the next wave. Because I do think technology for hitting has obviously advanced tremendously. And I think that's been a big contributor to why we're seeing such great hitting now and how much it's improved and just <laughs> gone crazy in these last 10 years or so. But you know, we have more and more educational resources for pitching too. And I think of, for example, like Amanda Scarborough's Pitching Angel and that business that she runs and, and many others. So I think I'm just excited to see how pitching continues to develop and grow in our sport. The other thing that's standing out to me right now, and I said this before, but I think it's more and more important as the season goes on, we can't forget about teams. And I'm talking about the teams before it was kind of like, oh, don't forget about the teams that are not in the top 10 in the rankings. Now I'm kind of talking about let's let's not forget teams even beyond that, right? Like people who aren't ranked or at least aren't ranked consistently across all the different polls that we have. A couple of examples I'll give you. So after four weeks, you know, <laughs> stats change very quickly. But after the first four weekends, Stanford, 18 and four on the season, not ranked, getting votes, but not ranked. They have Elena Vodder, who's been leading in the circle in terms of wins in the entire Pac-12 top five in case. Then you have Taylor Gindelsberger as well, who's the top five in batting average in the Pac-12 and in stolen bases as well. Emily Young, who's the shortstop, she's the top five in RBI in the entire Pac-12 conference. So you take a look at someone like Stanford. Then you also look at like Oregon State. We're 19-3 and three after the first four weeks. And you have Mariah Maison in the circle, as well as Tarni Stepto from Team Australia. A lot of experience there. They're both top five in strikeouts 
in the Pac-12. And then Frankie Hamudi, top five in home runs and batting average, actually top batting average, again, after the four weeks, could change really quickly, and top five in, in home runs. She was leading at one point as well. So you look at not only the teams and how they're doing, and then you look at sort of the weapons that they have on their roster. And, you know, some people might say like, well, you have to look at the the strength of schedule. Like these teams weren't at the St. Pete Clearwater Elite Invitational, for example. But, you know, they still played some good teams. Stanford actually took a game from Oklahoma State in Stillwater. In Stillwater. Like that's, that's another layer of difficulty there. And they were able to do it. Oregon State beat Tennessee at Mary Nutter. So it's just a couple of examples. I think there are a lot of these. We could look at similar types of teams across the country. And you just can't forget these types of teams, especially with conference play starting soon. For the Pac-12, which happens to be the example I'm using right now, conference play usually starts after week five for the Pac. So there's kind of one more weekend of preseason play, and then it gets started. And Stanford and Oregon State were both picked to be in the bottom half of the conference in the preseason poll. But they could shake things up. And I think we just need to pay attention to that stuff across the board with college softball. So to boil it down, the lesson is to pay attention. And someone who is constantly paying attention to really everything in the sports world, it seems, is today's guest. So let's head into the interview. She's an award-winning senior writer and NBA insider at ESPN, but the list really goes on. Radio host, TV personality, (laughs) podcaster, she's done it all, and Stanford softball alum, Ramona Shelburne. Ramona, I'm so excited. I know, I'm I'm excited. We're making this happen. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, honestly, I'm honored to to make it in your schedule at all with the oh, craziness no, you always you have know, going it's on. Just a, it's NBA trade deadline se- season, which is um, a whole lot of um, stuff that doesn't happen, but you have to like <laughs> sort of breathlessly chase it the whole time. So yeah, that's that's our uh, <laughs> that's the week before <laughs> trade deadline. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you again for joining. And I will start off with the most important question that I will ask you today, which yeah. is. How is your son Daniel doing? He is napping. <laughs> <laughs> he is napping. Thank God. Um, uh, we, you notice I've, every time we try to schedule something, I'm like, hold on, he goes down for his nap about two, you know, two thirty. <laughs> so like, let's see if we can sneak it in. That's like, uh, he's great. He's really fun. He's also a three year old boy with like so much energy, and um, it's really fun because like it doesn't matter what's going on. Like he just always wants to play. Like I come home, mommy. You know, right? Um, and now during the pandemic, he's been home so much. So every work call, like everybody in the NBA seems to know my son because he like, you know, runs in the room when I'm on the phone. He'll be like, are you on the phone? I'm like, yes, I'm on with the GM of whatever. <laughs> but everybody understands. It's kind of fun. That's awesome. I mean, it's crazy yeah. to me because I, I remember going to your house before pandemic, which was, mm-hmm. you know, feels like a long time ago now because it kind of yeah. was. Yeah. And seeing him when he was still like a tiny infant yeah. baby and to see all the pictures and things you post now, it's it's just crazy how much he's grown. Yeah, well, that, that's what happens. They get bigger and they talk more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> he's fine, though. Like, he, I, I, it's, I'm not going to lie. Like, I was I really wanted I'm like, you know, an athlete myself. So like I was just like, man, I hope he's athletic. I really hope he likes sports. I hope he's got some skills. And like, I could tell it was about six months. He was already like wanting to stand up. And I was like, okay, this is good. And he started walking at nine months. And I was like, yeah, get it, kid. <laughs> right? Like, let's go. And, yeah. uh, and then finally, um, he walked really young. And I was like, oh, wait, why was I rooting for that? Because then once they walk, <laughs> you have to chase them um, they don't stop yeah. yeah and now now he doesn't walk he runs everywhere it's like he's he hustles man everywhere he goes it's hustling and uh it's fun but it's also like a lot of um like you know I'm like amazed at how athletic he is already because he can like climb the rock walls and he's like he has 15 months and he's like kicking the soccer ball with his left foot and I'm like yes awesome all right like this is awesome but uh but I also have this feeling of like I really have to let him gravitate towards the sports he likes and not just what I like. I keep forcing the baseball on him. I keep forcing it. And he's just like, I don't, he's not getting it yet. You know? So I don't know. Maybe he's going to be soccer. Maybe he'll be like a karate kid or so. I don't know. We'll just give him time. We'll give him time. Yeah. We won't give up on yeah. him yet. Yeah. For the bat and ball sport. Yeah, he's only three. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I know I'm sure he's been decked out in Stanford stuff. That, that we're not waiting on. That's going to no. – he doesn't have a choice. No? I don't know. This is the thing. He He's at that age where he only wears certain clothes. Mm. So, like, he has – he wears Sesame Street um, <laughs> shirts 
it's it's like it's it's Cookie Monster, Oscar the Grouch, Big Bird, Elmo. And yeah. then he wears these pants. He has two pants, okay? And they're from a little company that my friend owns and and it's like it's called Carry Your Heart. And one of them has llamas on it and the other has dinosaurs. And he just won't wear any other pants. And so we just I just told my friend, I'm like, I'm just gonna order like ten of the same kind. So we just it's like his uniform and I can't get him to wear anything else. If I it's a big fight and it's not worth the fight. So we just, you know, <laughs> stand for here. I have plenty of it, but I don't he won't wear it, you know. Yeah, well, hey, I mean, I, I respect his, like, knowing what he wants. So I'll, I'll yeah, give him that. Yeah, but yeah. maybe maybe we can mix some Stanford trees in there at some point. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> There's certain things. They have a strong will. They don't They do not do what you want them to do all the time. <laughs> well, I wonder where he gets the strong will from, though. From yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, it's so cool, like, just seeing – from the early days, like I remember seeing you, like since I'm from Camarillo, like yeah. you used to play slow pitch, like in Newberry yep, Park, you know, Park, at, yep. yeah, yeah, at the softball fields and seeing that. And then you were working at the Daily News. And that was kind of when I was in high school, too. So there, you know, you would cover a lot of the local sports and things and then Stanford alumni events. And then now here, here you are. And, and here we are on the podcast. So it's just like, yeah, really cool. I look awesome. I look like, <laughs> I was like, I was going to put some makeup on for you. And I was like, I don't know. I'm just on the phone all morning. Let's just do this. We're doing a hat. We're doing a, we're, it, you know, it's one of those. Honestly, I, I think like, we know we're about to get some good stuff from you. Yeah. Uh, so we don't care. Yeah. <laughs> no one cares. Everyone's okay. excited to, to read whatever yeah. you're going to write next. Let's yeah. put it that way. <laughs> so, all right. So what do you want to know about? I want to know about everything, but I, I'm going to yeah. respect your time. So we'll, we'll only touch on a few things, but. I wanted to ask you too, like, obviously there's Mendoza who we just had on the show recently mm -hmm. too. So I'm yep. super excited to have you on too, for all the connections there. But other than her, who else do you kind of maintain relationships with since um, Stanford softball well, days? I mean, our, our text chain is bopping right now. Like <laughs> we have, let's see who's in this text chain. This is like our, uh, there's about 12 people in this one, 10 people. Yeah. Uh, let's see, there's Mendoza. Uh it's like the whole text chain, right? Uh, <laughs> Michelle Acosta, who's a couple of years older. Marcy Crouch, Kelly Wigginton, Jenny Foyle. Uh, Becky, uh, Becky Bassini now is her name. Uh, she was Becky Blevins in college. Lauren Gelman, uh, Michelle Schneider, Kelly Yablonski, Shane Anderson. Now she has last, she's Shane Skeet. There's a few of these in Michelle Schneider's Duke now. There, I have them in there with their maiden names usually. Oh, um, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Same with like all the, yeah, they're yeah. always going to be uh, that. Yeah, we're always texting. I still keep in touch with, um, you know, we have like a very vibrant group text that keeps that keeps, you know, bouncing around. Um, and then just kind of like when we're in town, right? Like a couple of years ago before pandemic, we all got together in L.A. once. sometimes over the years we get together at each other's weddings and stuff. Um, yeah. But uh, so maybe the older group, I keep in touch with a bit more like yeah. the people who are like a year or two or three older than me. Um, cause I was like one of, I was in a really small class. It was just me and Jenny Scheidler, you know, and, um, she, uh, we were the only two in that class. Yeah. We had Sarah Barnum, who was a walk on. She didn't play all four years, but she, and then Brianne Ford, she was, um, she was in our class as well. Same, but I think she only, I think they each only played two years. Um, mm. and so, um, the, the younger, uh, group that I was, I keep in touch with some of them as well. Um, like, uh, I still talk to Kira Ching sometimes uh some of the who else do i talk to in that younger group um oh robin robin she's stenerson now robin walker sarah beeson um she's sarah anderson now uh there's you know like the people who are one one or two years younger than me yeah um, obviously yeah. jess gallister who is our coach uh yeah. which is awesome tori nyberg uh you know just kind of like the ones who i played with mostly and then yeah. i actually have kind of stayed uh, i got to know your group even though you were younger than me and yeah. then um, Ashley Hansen, I still kind of keep in touch with her through social media and stuff. A um, few of the younger ones, because I, I mostly met you guys through like, how did I meet? How did we meet? I mean, you I kind of knew from daily news stuff, but um, I guess uh, like going to, we used to have like uh, alumni days and stuff. Yeah, and, like, I think it was, kind of yes, I think we did like a barbecue. Yeah. I, we used to try to like play a game and then eventually everyone was like, let's just eat food yeah. together. You know? Yeah, I was... Uh, it's funny because I was like totally still playing all the time. And I was like, let's play. Why are you guys don't want to play? And, yeah. uh, and now I understand because I'm like, I don't play anymore. So I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, or since I had my kid, I just don't have time. Like, it's, I mean, I would, but 
it's too far to drive out there. And it's like, if I have a free four hours, I'm going to, you know, I don't want to spend half of it driving and playing. And I just want to like veg out of the couch. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but, just catch up with everyone. Eventually. I think I'll probably just coach. I'll probably just coach my son's teams, you know, like just. Yeah. I, I love that. Yeah. Be I like love that, that year old mama out there coaching the baseball team. <laughs> exactly. I love that. Like a female head coach. Yeah, love it. dude. <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm kind of demanding though. <laughs> like, I don't know if I'd be a good coach. Uh, that, I, that might just be what might be what good. Would make yeah. Good yeah. Coach. yeah. 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 You no know, participation trophies here. No, you know? like, no, yeah. no. We don't, we're, <laughs> we're past. We're not doing yeah. that. Yeah. That's, we're more old school than that. <laughs> yeah. We're totally old school. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, I, yeah. you know, it's, it's fun too. Cause I, cause every, well, not every year, but oftentimes around the world series time, you know, those clips, yeah. you and Mendoza teammates again, kind of at ESPN and like the clips of you guys playing against LSU in the world yeah. series and you guys run into each other going after the same ball or she hits you in on that double. Like I, I feel still, like you guys go over that a lot. Listen, <laughs> listen, I was going to catch the ball, Jenna. Like I have freeze frame photography. We slowed it down. And if you look, I am there before her, the ball's going in my glove and then she's mm. just taller than me and she jumped a little bit later. And so she like got in there and I was like, dude, and I showed her, I sent it to her. I was like, Jess, you took my moment, dude. That was my catch. <laughs> I was going to steal it. It was like, or at the wall. No, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> <laughs> she caught the damn ball. Who knows if I would have still been hanging up there and catching it. But I mean, um, I'll say both of you clearly showed range. Let's put it that way. Well, that's the reason we got into it is because we were so hyped. <laughs> that we were just like sprinting so fast and like neither of us even we ran so far like I was in right field she's in center I I don't think either of us ever considered that somebody else would be there because we went so far to get the ball totally yeah yeah it's like you it's know so normally funny. when you're you're sure you know you're pretty sure that you're gonna um you know you're running t- towards the center fielder you'd know but it was yeah. like a deep angle at the wall and I ran so far and she ran so far there's no way I never even thought she would be there yeah, yeah, I know. It's I didn't hear any footsteps. I didn't, no, I don't know if either <laughs> called it. I mean, you know, no. I kind of feel like you did. Like at least looking at it, like I don't remember you seeing you guys like mouthing anything. I think you were just yeah. like all in. Yeah, yeah, we were just totally running to catch the ball at the fence because it was me a home run. You know? Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, why not? So. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, I, I just I love seeing the throwbacks too, you know, because it was yeah. before everything was as televised as it is today. So it's always yeah. fun. I think when, that was the first year that they televised all the games. Yeah. So it's 2001, and um, it was the first year that every single World Series game was on. Mm. Before that, they would televise, like, some of the early rounds, but not all. And then um, mostly, I think they picked it up when it got to, like, the semifinals and finals. Yeah. Yeah, right. that sounds yeah. right. It's yeah, also, for- I think, the first year, from what I remember, of Super Regionals. Before that, yes. it was just um, Regionals. We used to – my freshman year was only four teams. Then, um, then it got to be six teams in regionals. And then I think, I can't remember how it went, but I, I feel like it was like six and then two, like, and then we're maybe mm-hmm. eight and then two. I can't, I can't remember how it was, but it was like, it was a really big difference when they went to super regionals. It really they was. Did. I mean, yeah. I actually, in some ways, obviously not always, but in some ways, super regionals, I even, I like a little bit more than the world series yeah, just because yeah, yeah. of the, it's like getting to that. Oklahoma yes. City opportunity, you, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that, but you're totally right. That's been like a yeah. new thing that was thrown in. People don't always realize that too, that that wasn't yeah. always there. Yeah, my freshman year, it was like four teams. Yeah. Four teams per regional. Eight, it was eight regionals and four teams each, which is 32 teams total. Yeah. And we got, and we were the number one seed, but we got sent to Oklahoma State because we didn't have lights at the field. Amazing, See, the, right? How crazy is that? It's like, and UCLA used to be that way. Washington yep. used to be that way. Yep. It's wild. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy how far we all had come. to go on the road. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, if you were writing a profile or a feature on yourself now, huh. how okay. would you have described yourself as a player? As a player? That's interesting. <laughs> um, so it's, it's hard for me to separate myself and have any objectivity because I'm very hard on myself as a player and I look back at my athletic career and I wish I would have been able to like kind of um, get out of my own head a little bit more and uh, just kind of like let it rip. But that was like the story by four years. Right. So like I had mm-hmm. moments where I was always like, I would like, I would kind of get through it. I would work through, it. I was constantly like battling my own like stuff, right. Like your own, you know, I had issues throwing the ball. Cause I, um, once that gets in your head, it's really hard, you know, like, 
so it changed my emotion a little bit and then I had to, um, and I had to do it. And so I feel like a lot of ways I was always like when I was at Stanford, at least like I was like, I think I was pretty athletic and talented. Like I definitely could have had a much better career than I did in terms of just like statistics and numbers and stuff. But I always, I just kind of like turned into this like good um, team player and like really good defensively. And then I would just kind of do all the little things. Like I would, I was kind of scrappy on the bases. I was a good teammate. I was like a good defensive player. And then um, I just, I don't think I worked hard enough at hitting. I think I I was just so mental with hitting that um, I almost like, and I, it's actually something that's followed me even to my, into my uh, later career is like, I never like watched film of myself Mm -hmm. um, because I was too self-conscious and um, I would feel bad about myself. And I just thought that was worse. And like in my head, I thought all I needed to do was just relax and just like hit and just let the muscle memory take over. But I probably should have just like really dug in and studied more and relaxed more and, you know, like not relaxed more, like studied more. And like, but I almost felt like, you know, my problem is that I'm too analytical and too cerebral. So I need to stop and just get out of that, you know, um, that part of my brain and get into the like, you know, just muscle memory, instinctual brain. And so I was always trying to like battle. And that's, it's very typical of Stanford athletes. Right. So, um, you know, I felt like I was always trying to like, it's something I was, I I always think about in my own career and just like what you do in life. Um, the important thing is to keep going, right. The important thing is to not stop when you hit adversity or failure or whatever it is. The important thing is to just be scrappy and to, like find a way to make yourself important and good and useful and valuable no matter what. Like even if, you know, you have some challenge that you're working through, you have some issues that you're dealing with. And so like even in my career, like there are times where when I first started out, it took me a long time to make it. I was like seven years covering at the Daily News where it was mostly high schools and some sometimes um, I would get so lucky if I got to cover like a women's basketball game at, or, or a, a, you know, college soccer or volleyball or something. And so for a lot of it for me was like, you know, just keep grinding, keep trying to find some way through. And, um, I would keep working my skill set, And then just one day it like, I got, you know, a a couple of breaks and it just kind of happened pretty fast from there. But it was like seven years of like really running up against walls. And so I was like all the way into my, I guess I was 30. I was 30 before I finally started getting like 29, 30 before I finally started like quote unquote, make it or break it or whatever you want to call. Um, and, uh, but I, because I just kept going because I kept working on stuff, like by the time I got those opportunities, I had a lot more skills and I had a lot more feistiness, you know? And, um, I think that's kind of how I was as a player too. Like, yeah, I mean, you could tell that was like, totally in my head all the time. And like, I was always as a hitter, I was kind of, um, just, you know, thinking too much and just, but like probably not thinking enough and you know, all that stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know? And so, um, but I still played a lot and I made myself valuable. And if you ask my teammates and coaches, they'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, she was really good. Right. And I was like, yeah, do you know, I didn't even hit 200 in college. Like I, you know, like it was really embar- <laughs> like to the point where it's like, I was like going through my papers the other day. And, um, I remember, um, they were like, you know how they have like the, the game notes or something and they put yeah. like you know, expected batting order or something. And yeah. like, if you have like offensive stats worth writing home about, they'll, they'll like put them in there. But if you like suck, they'll just started 49 games and right field, you know, like, so like that least, <laughs> you know, third on the team and run scored or whatever, you know, like, cause my, my stats were always not good. And, and like there, I mean, I had a couple times where I'd have good runs, but um, it was mostly, and I remember like my senior year, I remember feeling like I got to a good start. And then um, like us, when we hit pack 10 play, everybody's average went like that. Oh, yes. Right. And, you know, yeah. Right. Um, and, uh, and it was like, I remember at one point, like I could tell my career batting average was like up over two something. And I was like, yes, come on. Just, I just have to finish my year, my career. It has to be over two. It has to be over two. And I went through kind of like a slump kind of in the, towards the end of the year. And it was like ducking under there. It was like maybe like 197. And I was like, it's not going to happen. Is it? It's not going to happen. It's going to be like for all of eternity. It's going to be like below the Mendoza line. And I was like, okay, just let it go. Just let it go. It is what it is. It is what yeah. it is, right? And um, and I remember when I let when I let that go, I was like, it was kind of freeing. And then, now, yeah, I'll tell you this: twenty years later, I'm like, damn, I'm really I, could do it. <laughs> <laughs> I still think about it. But um, but like, I, I think that like what you learn in softball and kind of like who you are as a player, it really is who you are in the life. 
Like it yes. really is. And you take all of it with you. Like, so I wrote a story last week about Ben Simmons from the Sixers and he has trouble shooting the ball. He's like got the yips. He can't make free throws. He can't shoot. I mean, he can, but he, it's in his head now. And, yep. and I was like, well, I, I totally get that. <laughs> like, I mean, I did that in college. And so like when I report and write on it, like I just know the right, not the right questions to ask, but I, I see it differently than other people. Like a lot of, a lot of people see it as like weakness or something. And, and I'm like, no, 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 that's actually, you're trying too hard. Like you, right. you care too much. And then it gets in your head and you just, you know, you're, you're trying to be too perfect or you're trying to please people or you're trying to live up to some kind of unmatchable ideal. And, um, and so like, I don't know. I, 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 I think people know that you, when you played, whether you played softball or basketball or whatever you're covering, whatever it is, um, I think people can tell, like, if you understand, like, if you get yeah. it, if you were there once. And so, um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess, like, I, don't, I wouldn't write a profile of myself as a player because I probably wasn't all that good, to be honest. Like, I was, like, batted ninth mostly. Um, but I was, like, I, I could have been a lot better. Like, I, I, th- I don't think I was, like, an – I was probably an underachiever rather than an overachiever. Um, but I actually, when I look back on it, I'm, like, proud of the fact I kept going. Yeah. Because – it was hard. You know, you know how it is with that the pressure cooker that we all get in. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah, and you're 100 percent right that it's yeah. very common with Stanford athletes to be oh, yeah. overly cerebral, overthink, overevaluate. I mean, I I can relate to that, especially for my first three years of my career. Yeah. That was me, and I would actually yeah. overtrain too. Like yeah, I, I overtrain, it's like yeah. I didn't realize actually. It's sometimes it's productive to step away from this. You know, I would yeah. overdo it, and I yeah sure I'd pass all the conditioning tests. Yeah. I'd like do this and do that, but you know, like I, I very much would like look at the numbers and things like mm-hmm. that. And it wasn't what I could have done either. And then finally yep. in my senior year, I began to let that go. I was like, this is it. You know, I mean, this is the last year. There's nothing else after this in terms of my collegiate career. So like, I'm right. just going to try to be me. And then it, it did yeah. click, you know, yeah. and it did happen. And, but it's a lot like easier said than done when you're, when you're in it and you know, you only have Oh, I only have these four years, yeah. you know? And, and I would always get it going for like a month or two at a time, but then something would happen and I would like revert back and, or like something would, and it would spiral again. And you just kind of have to keep going. Like that's it. Yeah. You just have to go and don't stop and push yourself through it. And like, I'm telling you like in life and in my career, like I, I think about that so much all the time. I mean, you know, even through pr- profession, there'll be times where like, you're kind of like the the sun's shining on you, right? You're like a little more of a golden place. Like people like you and what you do and what you're doing and all that. And, um, and then there are other times where like just things change, right? Like the, the teams where you're best at are not good anymore. Um, an athlete that you're seen as, you know, uh, an expert on is retires, whatever. Um, you get different bosses, different editors, different, you know, lay of the land. And the people who have nice long careers are the ones who adjust and make themselves and reinvent and, and keep going. And who yeah. also are fine when the sun isn't shining on them for a little while because they just kind of keep your head down, focus on the work and get through it. And then it'll come back around because that's how yeah. it is in life and anything you do. Um, and uh, like I've gone through, I mean, even through having kids, right? So, you know, the last, I don't know, five, five years, I guess, because my yeah. son's three. Um, so there's, there's a whole year where you're pregnant before, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's like, I feel like I've done some really good work, but I haven't been quite as all about the, and like, you know, like your, your, your priorities are split. You have, you're, you're a young mom, you have like a kid under five. That's like a lot of work. And, you know, it used to be like, I would take it, I would go on the road all the time. I would always be raising my hand, let's go. And I'd yeah. spend as much time as I needed to for a start. I'd spend a week if I could. Now I'm like, we're going to, we got three days. Let's get in and out. We got to make the most of those three days. Let's, 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 you know, and, and I don't know that, or even staying up writing, like, okay, I used to mm. stay up and write all night long. Now I can't do that. I got to get up in the morning and take care of a kid or I got to, you know, I don't have the energy as much to, to pull all nighters like I used to, because I'm chasing around a toddler all the time and you just kind of adjust. I think you just get way yeah. more efficient and way more um, focused on what you actually need to do and what's most important. And there was a time when I almost felt bad about it. Like, I was like, oh, am I not working as hard? I'm like, no, I think I'm working. I think production wise, I'm just as good. You're working um, smarter. Yeah. Yeah. You're working smarter. And that's just kind of like what your life and your career is. Like, you just have to like be able to adjust and be scrappy and always figure out what people actually want to read and what's important and prioritize those things. Yeah. 
See, I love that you've just naturally kind of made that bridge between softball, your athletic experience and life skills, because that really is what it is. Mm -hmm. And you talk about, there's a lot of things that you've mentioned that, that I think are super interesting that I want to dig in more on. But one of them is in terms of prioritization, like you talked about it earlier, that grind of, of, you know, working for the daily news for a while before you went over to ESPN and all that stuff. And that was also from our conversations, you've told me like, well, you were prioritizing your family and being in California and Southern California, yeah. you, you could have moved somewhere else, oh, yeah. you know, and maybe done that, but you had yeah. your priorities very clear. And I've always thought that that was, yeah, has served you well. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did that even in choosing Stanford, right? So yeah. I got into yeah. Harvard and I got into some other East coast schools. I really loved Harvard. I love the coach there. I love the team there, Boston, this, it's Harvard, right? Um, yeah. and, uh, I remember I had a friend from high school who went there. Her name was Dale Sugar. She was, um, uh, she went to Harvard the year, um, before me. And I was like, so tell me the truth. If I go to Harvard, how often am I going to see my family? Like how often, how far away do you feel? And she was like, to be honest, you're going to see them twice a year. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. Okay. Like, she's like, you're going to see them at Christmas and maybe, maybe spring break, but probably just summers. And she's like, and after the first year, you may not even see them in the summers because you're going to do internships probably out here. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, and they don't come to see you? And she's like, well, they, I mean, you you could, but it's a long trip and you're just going to see them for a weekend or something. And I was like, oh man, that's a really big difference. Whereas like, I'm from LA, I want to go to school at Stanford. And um, my parents came up every softball weekend, you know, or I went down whenever I wanted. It's an hour flight or a yep. drive. And like, I saw my parents all the time. I'm still really close to them. And so, um, you know, there's still a part of me that's like the road lot taken, right? Like I really liked Harvard. I really love the idea of being in Boston. Um, uh, but I just felt like for my life in as a whole, like it was just more important to me close to, to I'm really close to my family. I just, yeah. Yeah, I'm really close to my parents, really close to my cousins, my aunts, my uncles. Like yep. I just, I didn't want to end up living on the East coast and seeing them twice a year. Right. You know, I mean, you, you go to school someplace and then you, you get an internship someplace, you get a job someplace, maybe you end up meeting the guy someplace or, yeah. or significant other, right? Like, and you end up living all the way across the country and seeing your family a couple times a year. And that's, I don't know, I just didn't think that was me and it's not the life I wanted. And so I felt the same way about the job. Like, you know, there was a part of me, it's like, oh, I wanted to go to New York. I wanted to do Teach for America. I was going to go all over. I was going to, you know. Um, I traveled around Europe. I was like, oh, it'd be so cool to be like an expat here, get a job in Rome or Paris or yeah. whatever. Um, but I was like, mm, you know, maybe I just take vacations, right? Like yeah. <laughs> maybe I don't need to live here. Like, I mean, maybe it's a cool theoretical thing, but in reality, it would be kind of lonely. I'd feel very homesick and I wouldn't be around my folks and would yeah. be around my family. And like, that's just, these are life choices. And I, I, especially now that I have a family of my own, it's, I'm so glad I did that. My parents live 10 minutes from me. My mom comes over three times a week. She's here now, you know, like she's watching <laughs> my son when he wakes up from the nap. Like, you know, we have, it's like, we have such a night. She comes over, I have a pool. Cause so everybody comes to my house to swim, like especially during a pandemic. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really, it's really, um, these are big life things that you have to chart for yourself. And like, if something's really important to you, I always say this in whatever decision you make, something's really important to you, you're going to find a way to get that done. You're going to choose that. And you'll know, you know, like there was that, what was that thing on social media? The red pill, blue pill. Oh yeah. Yeah. One of it, one of them was like, you can go back to being six years old, but knowing everything you know now, so you could like relive your life basically knowing with all the knowledge or Mm -hmm. the other one was you can take $10 million right now and be the age you are. And I was like, 100% take the 10 mil. Like, yeah. I don't want to go back to being six because I like how my life turned out. I, I chose the things that were most important to me. There's things I would do differently if I could do them over. But then if I did that, it's a butterfly effect. You don't know how, you know, one thing leads to another. And like yeah. my mom and I were just talking about parenting the other day and like, you know, how people think like, oh, I, I, I never want my kid to feel hurt. Never want my kid to feel sad. I don't. And the truth is though, like you grow through those experiences. Like you can't, like some of my best like growing and character defining experiences are when things sucked, right? Yeah. <laughs> I felt yeah. terrible about myself or I felt whatever. So like, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back and change it. Cause I like where I ended up. Yeah. See, and I, I like too, that you made the choice and then you 
ran with it and you like trusted those yeah. choices, you know, yeah. like you, you knew, well, okay, I'm not going to yes move. No. I mean, I didn't know. I mean, well, I, you, right. know, I you didn't know, them, but, but you then also like at the time, if it didn't work out, maybe I'd be sitting here going, damn, I was kind of a wuss. I should have taken those jobs in New York. Right. I mean, true. But, but I, I, I just, I went with it, you know, but I think the fact that you committed yourself to it more, at mm-hmm. least helped it be better in oh, the yeah. end. You know, if you, if you're kind of like, sure, I'll make this choice, but you keep hesitating yep. and like looking back, that's, not going to yeah, serve you, yeah, but you're like, all right, I'm going to stay in SoCal. I'm yep. going to grind this out, you know, until yep. I get where I want to go. And that mindset helps you yeah. more in the end. Yeah. And, and like, I always think that like whenever uh, everybody feels stuck all the time, all the time you feel like stuck and you can't do stuff and you don't know what you want to do with your, the next yeah. phases and this and that. But, um, there's so many things you just have to sit and think about what you should do. Like I'm a big like list maker and, um, oh, yeah. Um, and, and I, I just free write. It's like, it's like free writing this. It's not like I'm all like one call on this one. Oh yeah. I just, you know, whenever I can't like a, a, even just like a month or two ago, I was like, man, I feel like I am a little, a little restless. Like I need to go and do a few stories and dive in, but it's hard with the surge that was going on and can't go anywhere. And, and a lot of times like in my business, like you feel kind of beholden to access. Like oh. you feel like the stories are where I can go to. Like it's the event, it's the game, it's the practice, it's the press conference, whatever. And I think if anything, we've all learned over the last couple of years, like you mm. can do it from anywhere. Like, to be honest, like I can do, sorry, I got an alert on my phone, my computer. Um, I can, yeah. I just wrote three or four stories entirely over the phone. Now, these are contacts that I've spent, you know, decades building up. So it's not like yeah. I, I wouldn't have been able to do this with just cold calling people. But right. enough of these, I've met enough of these people over the course of my career in person and we know each other sure. that like, I really can do stuff over the phone. Like, and I, and I know how to write a scene, a scene that I wasn't there for. I know how to recreate it because I yeah. ask the right questions or I ask, you know, people to fill in very um, specific details to help me recreate it. But um, it's an interesting, it's interesting. And so I, I remember I just like, I don't know, like over the holidays, I was really yeah. kind of like restless. Like I haven't been doing enough and. And I just sat down and made a list of like 10 things to, that I can go work on. And I just started chipping away at it, you know, like, okay, let's start doing this. Let's start doing that. Let's start, you know, so. I know sometimes it's simple, even if it doesn't feel easy, it's like, it's simple. Like the concepts yeah. are simple and we just have to simplify it and let ourselves accept that it doesn't have to be complicated sometimes, but it's so well, much easier. I, I, said think, than I think even, I think complicated might even be the wrong word. I think it just feels big. Yeah right? It feels overwhelming. It's kind of like cleaning your garage, right? You don't want to, most people don't start because it just feels like a huge task. But if you just chip away a couple hours every, you know, if you just said, hey, can you clean your garage two hours every week? Be like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Right. If I do it two hours every week, like I've kind of been doing that over the past few months. I have an organizer who comes and she like forces me to do it. Yeah. And I'll just sit with her for a couple hours and it's like, oh, we're actually making progress <laughs> now. Like I, you know, if I would have done this on my own. I would have never done this, you know? Totally. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I really yeah. like that. Yeah. It's just a little bit at a time. And we, it's like, we know that concept, but it's hard yeah. for us to put it into practice. Yeah. That's why you just sit down and get a piece of paper out or on your notepad on your phone or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and something you mentioned earlier too, and you talked about building relationships, but also the fact mm-hmm. that you're able to relate to these athletes having been an athlete, because I think that that's yeah. something that you're just incredible at. Like that's one of the things that sets you apart with your stories is understanding that they're people and understanding mm-hmm. like the motivations and, and what the realities are of the situation versus like anything that could be projected on the situation. Um, and, and I've always really appreciated that when I'm yeah. reading your work or listening to your work mm-hmm. or watching your work, cause you have so many different yeah. media formats that yeah. you work in. But um, yeah. do you think like with your athletic experience, has it ever been difficult to kind of separate that level yeah. of relating to them versus like trying to be objective? Oh yeah, totally. I mean, and the, the truth is like, nobody wants to hear about my glory days. Okay. <laughs> Talking to like some NBA players and like, they appreciate the fact that I did play yeah. and you can feel a sense of understanding and empathy, but they don't really want to hear, you know, <laughs> they don't really want to hear from, you know, about, Hey, when we were playing Cal that one time, you know, I mean, it's like, <laughs> yeah. like, and I remember when I was first, um, when I was first doing the job, like, especially when I cover high school softball or whatever, like it was very fresh to me from when I was in that same position. Yeah. And I used to tell people all about my, my own career and my own life and stuff like that. And that was like, at some point I was like, 
you're not on the team anymore, Ramona. You know, like nobody cares. <laughs> you know, I think they know that you played. And so that's enough credibility. But really, it's like they want the story to be about them. Yeah. And, you know, it helps that you understand. But so I think early on, and I, and I definitely feel like there's certain things that I get like caught up in mm-hmm. and um, stories I'll get caught up in. And I feel like a little close and connected to it. And you have to be able to like step back and write from an editorial distance. Yeah. And so that's why, that's why I have a couple of really good editors that I'll talk things through and I'll be like, am I a little too close to this? Tell me, tell me what I'm not seeing. Tell me the big picture thing. Cause like, you know, when you're, especially when you're embedded with a person or, a, you know, I've done a few stories where you're kind of like embedded, right? like, you know, um, and you, it's like, you almost become part of their group. Well, and that, that comes and, with relationship building. Like you said, if you've built yeah, that, then yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like I, mean, I did like Ronda Rousey stories when she yeah. was, you know, top of her game. Right. And I would go to her. Um, I would, I was embedded. I mean, I was like at her camp, you know, four or five days a week during while I was, you know, relationship building. And then when they went to Australia, I went on the same flights and I was there. I would go to all the training sessions. And a lot of the time I'm just there. Yeah. I'm not always, because you never know when there's going to be some cool moment or some like great scene or whatever. And you're just there. Um, and, uh, I remember when I was writing some stuff, there was some tricky stuff to write about in there. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a, these weird accusations against her boyfriend, now husband, um, from a previous relationship. And we had to kind of sort through that. And, you know, I believe, I believed their version of events. It was investigated by some outside authorities and we were doing that, but I was like, but I also don't know the other side as well. We, right. Cause the other side didn't really talk to everybody. So, um, you know, I, that's where I really leaned on my editor. Mm. And I just said like, Hey, tell me what I'm not seeing. Cause like when you're in it, you know, what am I, you know, uh, what you don't always see things from the 10,000 feet anymore. Right. Um, and so like, yeah, I, you know, that's, uh, that's another thing I think team sports give you is this ability to like trust others, mm. you know, yeah. and like, Hey, I need your help on this. You got to keep me honest. Like I, you know, I don't always see it from the outside. So it's better. I mean, it's, I know the story inside and out because I'm in it, but you can see it, but I'm not seeing. Yeah. So that like openness to, to feedback, like that's how you interact oh, yeah. with teammates and things. Right. So like yeah. and your editors, your, your team basically that you're working yeah. with. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember you saying before too, that your mom is, is still kind of one of your best editors. Yeah. Although, um, maybe not, we don't have time for that. You know? yeah. <laughs> like, maybe before like, kids. Still, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Before kids. I mean, she has to help. She helps a lot. We talk about a lot of stuff. She's actually writing herself now. Yeah. Um, she's gotten kind of gone back to her own writing, but she taught me a lot about storytelling, a lot about writing, a lot about story structure and finding stuff. And I think one of the things that was great about, um, having my mom is just, she's, um, she always wants, um, she's not really a sports person. So, she wants to know what the story is, right? Not what the sports story is. You know what I mean? Like, and so I think the best stories are always when you get into like the deep human condition and, and just these sort of universal themes that everybody feels and right. sports is just the backdrop. And so I think with, um, with my mom, like, she, you know, when I would talk with her, she would always kind of get right to that point, mm-hmm. right? Like she would help me clarify it. And usually when I'm writing a longer story, like, you just need to be able to have one through line. That's really, really simple. You have to be able to explain it in like one or two lines. Yeah. Right. See, I I love these things that you're touching on too, just in terms of your approach and whether it's your mom or another editor you're working with, because Mm -hmm. I think that's what, what has allowed the longevity that you've had and what I'm sure you're going to continue to have is this, Mm -hmm. these kinds of approach approaches that you take. And then the making adjustments piece that you mentioned is so key. Yeah. And and you're right that that transcends sports, right? Like you played softball, right. but you cover NBA, you've covered the MLB before, like yeah. you cover all kinds of sports because there is that yeah. universal element to it. Yeah. And I think I, I mean, I know what I don't know also. So I don't try <laughs> to pretend that I'm some expert in things I'm not an expert in. Yeah. Um, when I, when I talk about football and around the horn, like I will go and I'll, I'll read up on stories and I'll, 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 I'll I understand football, but not like, somebody who played, you know, and I don't pretend like I do. Right. Um, I, and so I, I will focus, you know, I'll use stats to make my point or I'll use, you know, just sort of my experience in covering sports. Right. Right. Um, or in relationships. And I, you know, a lot of it, it's not always about breaking down the game. Right. Like, right. but I think, um, I think that, uh, the humility is a really important thing in this business, especially, and I, and I know it sounds weird, but for women, but, Mm. um, 
don't act like you know everything like you because you don't right yeah. like, it's very it's very off-putting sometimes i think we feel like we need to prove ourselves all the time to people and we need to always be this like expert and like as if it's like undercutting our credibility yep. especially as a woman like you feel like you have to overdo it yep. but i actually think the opposite is true i think if you have just sort of a confidence about yourself but you don't need to show off you don't need to just like i do you walk around spitting out stanford long words you know <laughs> you do that i mean i you know every once in a while i'll use a big word yeah but it, it's rare you only know, when it's I, relevant yeah right only when it's relevant i mean i don't go searching around for 12 letter words <laughs> and things that half my no not even half things that 10 percent of the audience isn't gonna know yeah i mean you know that well it, it's just not it's not productive and it's also it can be off-putting i think and I don't, I'm not saying dumb yourself down. I'm just saying, don't try to show off or don't put up a front. Right. Like you don't need to, like if you have confidence in your preparation and your intelligence, your analysis, your background, all of that, like you don't need to show off. Yeah. You just don't. And I think it's, um, also, you don't need, I think it's, it's, uh, it's really smart to ask for help. Yeah. Like I, I just all the time, like people, people are like, how do you know so much about basketball? I'm like, because I call up scouts and coaches and players and say, explain this to me. And then they do. And I make it, I really try to listen and try to understand it. Yes. Right. Like, and people love to, I mean, don't you love it when like campers come up to you and try to ask you to explain uh, the right footwork on turning a double play. Yeah. Like that's all, that's awesome. Right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, people who are professionals at what they do, like there's almost nothing more annoying than having somebody who is like not a professional at it, but is trying to be a critic at it. Right. Like, what they're doing and criticize them for it without asking why you did what you did or trying to understand it. Yeah. I mean, no, that's, yeah. that is such a good point because you do, you lose trust. Anybody, it's hard to trust someone that always thinks they're right. Yeah. Like to your point, you lose trust and then therefore the credibility kind of goes out the window yeah. and you just yeah. lose it. Like the, the connection's gone with your audience. Yeah. 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 It's like, eh, you're annoying, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, you're full of yourself. I mean, I, you know, I just, I think people mistake, um, people don't quite understand what confidence is sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes they think confidence is loud mm. and boisterous and stuff. And it, confidence is really just kind of within how you carry yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good distinction because it's really mm -hmm. easy. I and mean, we even talk about like introverts versus extroverts, right? Like extroverts sure. might be the louder ones in the room, but like, Hey, this introvert over here could actually bring a lot of value to whatever the conversation is. It's mm -hmm. like, it doesn't have to look a certain way, you know, we can. Yeah think about it a little bit differently. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's, that's super, super interesting. I would ask you too, like, what is your favorite piece that you've ever written or favorite story that you've covered in, in any uh, media format? I mean, I have a few, so I can't say one or the other. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I loved working on those stories with Rhonda. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know anything about UFC, right. I watch boxing. I know a little about that, but I was just more interested in, um, I think she was a different kind of feminist icon and I was really interested in that at that moment in time. Yep. Um, and she was so vulnerable, but also so strong. And I just, she was just a fascinating character and she was really open and, um, you know, plus it was, I like diving into worlds I'm not familiar with. Right. So I was like diving into the UFC world and, um, flew to Australia and I made this big grand adventure out of it. And it was, um, I, it was a really, it was just a, that was a, it was, it was also it also synced up with where I was in my life too. Like I was kind of trying to understand what to do with my own power and success in the mm -hmm. industry. And how do I process that without, um, like I want to just like, I, you know, I think a lot of times women like apologize for being good at things or I apologize for their own successes. Like they try to dumb themselves down yep. um, or they try to diminish themselves. And I was like, no, that, that was one of the things I think Rhonda did extremely well. She didn't, she didn't, diminish herself she she just like yeah i'm a badass i'm the baddest woman on the i mean it was like but she wasn't showing off she was just stating a fact right and um i thought that was something i was like kind of dealing with myself because i was like if you're you know once you have a level of success if you um it's kind of hard to be that in that space because you know people are jealous you know um you don't want to come off like you're showing off you don't want to come off like you're full of yourself right and so i was just trying to like figure out a new way of being um or just be comfortable in the way I was. Right. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I don't know, that was a, that was a really incredible experience. Um, I think also, you know, I did, 
did a bunch of stories with Kobe Bryant over the years, right? Um, and uh, he and I had a really good relationship through his playing career and even after that. And uh, I don't know, it's like when somebody who's like a great, amazing athlete, um, but also just like a totally interesting, curious person in the world, like when they let you in and they you can get deep with them and they, they're not always, you know, it's like we have more of a just like a talking relationship rather than like I'm always interviewing you, right? right? Like we were just in constant conversation. Um, it was interesting. That's another one where you're like, you're close to it. So I needed an editor to help, you know, pull me back and see things um, from 10,000 feet all the time. But, uh, but it was just like cool to get inside a mind like that. Yeah. Or a person that got a soul like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's awesome because these are kind of like generational people mm -hmm. with, within yeah. their sports or within their, you know, Sure. their area that they that they're in in the sports world inspirational that you, to me yeah like honestly like i feel like the, the the ones that i connect to the most are the ones that are kind of inspirational to me like the people i cover like you know you're writing about the human condition um and some incredible people but you're also kind of um you you it you affects you yourself yeah. you know it affects your life too you know like i i still think about things that i learned from kobe right i still think about things that i learned while getting to know Rhonda and how she was managing that, that time in her career and her life. Right. Yeah. Um, super smart people, on, you know, just in outside of sports. Right. And deep and they put, you know, they, they, they actually have a lot of similarities. Right. Um, but uh, like, I, you know, that's, that's the best part of our job is just, just get to meet these like generationally amazing athletes. Right. Like I'm, uh, you know, I have a couple of other athletes who I'm, you know, I've done multiple stories with. Right. And like, you feel like you get to know them. You, maintain the relationship like Allison Felix she's a yeah um you know she's out here we're like mom friends you know like we have yeah. kids at the same time our kids you know we we keep in touch that way but um yeah Candace Parker you know like some of the great female athletes like you just you just have these conversations with them that you're like ugh, blows your mind yeah right um so yeah that's I that's that's the best part of your job yeah right yeah didn't you go to Allison Felix like they she renewed her vows right and you went yeah yeah um well they were supposed to get married before the pandemic and then oh. you know then I'll change the indoor ceremony thing right so um yeah I went um a little while ago and it was you know she was uh I just I covered her in high school I wow. knew her from when she was out here in LA in high school so that was you know that was a long-term relationship I mean I didn't really cover I don't really cover track and feel I just written one or two stories about her before the Olympics or whatever. But um, it was just more like a, a long relationship we've had. And especially since we both became parents, like we've mm. gotten a lot closer, you know? Yeah. So. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I love yeah. seeing it. Also just women connecting with women. I know her family too, right? Like I know her, you know, I know her husband is awesome. Yeah. Her family, her parents, you know, it's like I know. I I've just that. known them forever, right? Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Well, I, you know, you, you said something recently that, reminded me of kind of this concept where you're saying sometimes if you if you reach a certain level of success too and, and especially mm -hmm. if you're connecting so well with everyone you're working with you you can you have to keep yourself like I don't know kind of keep your feet on the ground a little bit yeah but also I feel like it's like it's easy for us and this isn't this is in our jobs this is in softball this is in life it's like sometimes we might kind of be feeling ourselves a little bit, but then other times we're mm -hmm. a complete opposite end of the spectrum where we're oh, dealing totally. with yeah. imposter syndrome, you know, and we're like, I don't know oh, if yeah. I deserve I'm to be here. Things. How do you ride those waves? You know, coach used to oh. tell us like, don't get high, too high and don't get too low with hitting, for example. So in life, right. how do you kind of ride those waves? Yeah. All right. So we get to the part where I'm going to quote Bull Durham. <laughs> um, it's my favorite sports movie and it bothers me the other day. I went to my physical therapist and I was wearing a shirt that said, I believe in the church of baseball. And I was like, dude, you guys see my shirt? <laughs> and they were like, yeah. And I was like, Bull Durham. Like, and they're like, don't know what you're talking about. I was like, what? <laughs> Bull Durham, the greatest baseball, the greatest sports movie. Oh my God. Um, I love Bull Durham. That's like my sports movie Bible. Love like it's it. just so good. <laughs> and there's a scene where like, you know, Nuclear Lewis, that's the Tim Robbins character. He's the He's a pitcher, and uh, he's a uh, Ke Kevin Costner's character. He's the catcher to Crash Davis, right? And he's he's sort of the old veteran who's got to teach the 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 young stud pitcher who throws a hundred, but has like you know he's a flake, I guess is the right way to put it. Yeah. He's kind of a ditz, right? Um, and he's got to teach him how to he's got to teach him how to play, and he's got to teach him how to be a pro. 
And that's like his job that year in the minors. And, uh, and he goes, you know, kid, you got to play this game with a mix of fear and arrogance. Right. Mm. Right. You got to have this arrogance that like, nobody's going to hit my stuff. Like I'm the best pitcher out there. Like I'm filthy. Like I'm going to strike your ass out. Right. But you got to play this game. You also have to have that fear that that may not be enough. Right. That you may, that you may flame out, that you may, you know, screw it up. You may screw up that talent. And always think about that man you got to play this game with mixed fear and arrogance mona come on (laughs) right like you get to a certain level and that's it you don't want to peak there right you have to keep finding ways to be inspired and people who inspire you and ways of being and um it's it's like to me that's that's everything like you can't ever stop like you can never feel like you made it don't ever sit there and be like man i made it definitely take some moments to appreciate where what you've done and where you've been and accomplished but like don't ever stop. Like, don't ever, you know, get stuck anywhere or like rest on your laurels. Right. Yeah. And that's not to say like you should be a tortured soul or you should feel like not proud of yourself or whatever it is. It's more, you know, trust yourself and your accomplishments, your abilities, um, celebrate your account, you know, uh, everything that you've done, but also like, don't feel like you made it. Yeah. Don't ever feel like you're done because the second you think you made it, that's when it's over. Yeah. And it's interesting because you're right. Every athlete you've probably talked to has Mm -hmm. said that in some form or another, or has Mm -hmm. expressed that sort of mindset because that's how they get to be where they're at. And that's, and I would say like, in terms of what you do, your craft, like, is it too much to say? Like, I feel like you're a Kobe Bryant or a Ronda Rousey or an Allison Felix or whatever of sports writing, right? Like I, you know, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to say it. I'll say it. <laughs> well, okay. So there'll be times where you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about my life, my craft, my career. Yeah. But then like, if you don't do anything for six months, right. people will be like, what you been up to? Yeah. Oh yeah. She was good before she had kids, you know, like right. she was good for you for whatever. Like you got to keep going. Yeah. You can't, you can't just stop and be like, I made it. Let's hang up my shot now. Like I'm a coast. That's not, right. that's not how that life works. That's how your career works. You always have to like constantly evolve. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not just make adjustments. Like you made it to one, you made it to one mountaintop, but like, I'm trying to do more. Like, I'm not trying to say like one, you gotta, it, it takes a lot to get there. And this is like sports cliche. It takes a lot to get there. It's even harder to stay there. Yep. That's a hundred percent true. Yep. That's a hundred percent true. Um, and I don't think you ever try to stay there, which is the misnomer. Mm-hmm. Nobody tries to stay there. You always have to keep growing mm. and you have to keep evolving and growing and being. And for me, it's always about what I'm passionate about, what I'm curious about. And that changes and grows over time. Yeah. I, I love yeah. that point because you're right. No one who has ever achieved greatness has coasting in their DNA. <laughs> That's no. No. not how it works. I mean, take, you know what? Listen, when you when you go on a nice run, go take a vacation sometimes. Yeah. Go oh. enjoy yourself. You don't have to push yourself like crazy all the time. But That's not but coasting like, though. That's not coasting. No, that's not coasting. That's like taking a breath. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That distinction yeah. is is really important. Well, yeah. I mean, like I said in the beginning, I could, you're like, what do you want to know? I'm like everything. So I could keep going forever. But uh, so I end yep. every uh, conversation with the same game. It's called safer out. Basically, yep. I'll bring something up. If you like it or agree with it, you call it safe. If you don't like yep. it, you don't agree with it, you call it out. Got it. All right. So first one is leaking news. Before maybe the athlete announces something or before a team announces something like leaking it early, safer out safe that's my job yeah well that's what i'm interested well, I'm not leaking it leaking versus but, breaking mean, news do you know what i mean like is there a distinction well, to what it's a different side of the place so yeah i mean i try to break news right, right which involves somebody else leaking it true or confirming a leak but if so it's a little different if somebody right? asked you like if an athlete was like please don't say anything until x day and then you can announce it oh uh it depends yeah that's that's negotiable yeah Okay. It depends on the news value of it and what else is going on. Yeah. Um, you know, why they, why they're telling me this, why not, you know? Yeah. But yeah, my job is to break news because people want to know. Right. Like if I got, if I know somebody's going someplace, I don't care. Last night, Saturday night, uh, you know, I had a story. I heard about some women's basketball player who's like really good player going to sign with the Sparks. I'm like a Saturday night. Yep. Should I hold it? Hell no. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like it, news, the news the ways for no one, right? There's a like a huge public interest in that. Yeah. Now, if somebody said like, you know what? I've been talking to that person. Like, we're going to have an answer in the morning. I'll, you know, can, can you wait till the morning to put something out? Cause I don't want to blow it. Uh, you know, that's, that's something I would think about because you have to, um, 
well, it, you know, I don't want to report something and make it not true. Right. That's not good either. Right. So, yep. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. That was the first one. Sure. Old school batting helmets without the face masks, so like the ones you used to wear, safer out. Safe. <laughs> yeah, safe. You know, I think you Come can on. see better without the masks, I will say. I think you can. I know. I never tried the new ones, but I never got hit in the face. It was fine. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. I never got hit. I mean, you, you know, if the ball's coming at your head, you just turn, you know. Yeah. True. I true. I okay. Well, two more quick ones. Uh, NIL. So student athletes making money. Safer out. Safe? Ty goes to the runner. I guess. Yeah. I guess. I don't know. I it, We're at the very beginning stages of this. We need to have some kind of regulation. Right. It's a bit like the Wild West out there, but I'm I'm glad that they're um, – I guess I'm glad that it, I'm glad that we moved there because I just think that's the world. Yeah. But I also think that it's Pandora's box. that has been open, especially in like football and basketball. I agree. I think there's some value yep. for women, but yes, there, we have to, yeah. we have to make sure we get it right. All right. Last yeah, one. There's gotta be some regulation. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. Last one is bat flips. Safe or out? Safe. I'm into it. Wow. You all four yeah. safes. I don't know. You might be the first person where that's ever happened. I love it. Yeah. Okay. I'm kind of old school, but I also like, I like a little showboat. Like I, I was a little like that. <laughs> That's I mean, the arrogance me, part, right? The fear and the arrogance yeah. is the arrogance part. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I will, yeah. I have a little swag, man. Come on. Yeah, that's I'm fair. good with that. It's all good. Now, I mean, it's different. Like bat flip to me is one thing, bat flip and stare down the pitcher. That's another thing. Yeah. You don't, you don't try to show up your opponent, but like mm. if you, if you jack one out the yard and you like, you know, flip your bat a little bit and you, you know, then respectfully run around the base. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, I like right? that distinction too. Like the stare, yeah. you know, yeah. When the stare down is not okay. Right, 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 right. That's not okay. Unless somebody buzzed you, you know, yeah. somebody buzzed you and you know, you're going to stare from me. Yeah. But, but, uh, but bash is all right. It's all right. It's just, it's gotta be done tastefully. All right. Yeah. I like it. Hey, you actually scored too with four saves. Yeah. I like that. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. thank you again. This was awesome. Like I love so, just catching up with it. you, let alone in this kind of forum. So for sure. this was awesome. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't get all dressed up for you, but you guys are like, cool. Beast <laughs> well, I just have the Stanford softball shirt for you. So t-shirt. Yeah, I got a, I got a, a game of Thrones shirt on. <laughs> got house Stark. Yeah. Like um, it. and some beast Viviano up here. <laughs> <laughs> This conversation with Ramona has been in the pipeline for a while, and I just can never get over it. every time I talk to her. She's just so very thoughtful, insightful, and relatable, too, all at the same time. I feel like she just gets it. And those are the kinds of conversations that we all like to have, really, just with people who get it. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And with that, let's transition to the foul tip of the week. This week's foul tip is about generosity. Now, I feel like a lot of people think of generosity as financial, like giving money to charities or paying for something for someone else. That's really only part of it. The best generosity to me comes in different forms, especially with time and knowledge. These are two of the most precious commodities that we have on this earth. <laughs> And Ramona has actually always been a good example of this. You know, over the years, she shared her wisdom with me about the sports industry, career advice. We talked about Stanford a little bit too. And it ends up being conversations about life, right? And she gives her time to do that. And not everyone's like that. You know, we all say we want to make an impact, but it's easy to get really tunnel vision and just focus on ourselves and our individual goals. But the real impact comes from the value that we're able to give to other people. And it's a theme that comes up a lot on this podcast, I think, is the people that we have on almost always end up talking about how relationships have impacted them off the field. And that's what you remember, you know? I went to an old teammate of mine, her wedding recently, Maddie Kuhn, and uh, it was a Stanford softball reunion, basically. And, and it was amazing. What made it amazing, it really wasn't what happened on the field necessarily. There's a little bit of that kind of bond, obviously, but do I remember what Maddie's batting average was? No, but I do remember all the times that we shared in the locker room, traveling, team meals, and even all the good times after college and up to now, right? Like I remember when she took me to afternoon tea when I visited her in London and now we got to celebrate her wedding. And it's just, that's what she was most grateful for too that we all took the time to celebrate with her and just to be there. So just that time and how you use it, that's what matters and what sticks with you. And that's what's worth giving as well. We all need a reminder 
of that every once in a while. So that's it. Be generous. That's the foul tip of the week. You've been listening to Believe in Softball, part of the Believe Network and presented by Bet Online. The show is available anywhere you get your podcasts, wherever you listen, including Believe.com, and you can watch the videos on YouTube too. Subscribe, rate, and write a review for the show. I always appreciate your support. We love hearing what you think. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram as well, at Believe in Softball. Again, B-L-E-A-V. You can always reach out to me on Twitter, at JennaBacera01, and Instagram, at JennaBacera2. Thanks for tuning in, and catch you soon.